Pam 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 pam. Pam 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 pam. Pam 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 pam. Hey everybody. Come on in here. I know you want to. Tyler, Russell, Mark, Carla, and Arlene. And the rest of you. Polly and Kevin and Olga. Gather round. Make sure you run, run, I say, to grab your cup, your mug, your flask, your thermos. Grab it all. And when you've got it, you know what time it will be? I think you do. It will be time for the simultaneous sip. Will you join me, please, and lift your tankard for the simultaneous sip? Oh, that is good. Um, in a few minutes, we are going to have a guest on, Ed Latimer. Uh, I'll, I'll give a more detailed introduction in a minute. Uh, but while we're waiting for him to fire up the Periscope and select the guest option, um, let us talk about some uh, things in the news at the moment. All right. Um, so uh, apparently President Trump is getting a lot of uh, pushback for his horrible, horrible comments about war hero, d deceased, uh, deceased statesman and Senator John McCain. And every time I watch somebody complaining about the president's treatment of John McCain, I always ask myself the same thing. Would they say that privately? Would any of the people who are complaining terribly about the president's treatment of John McCain, if you were in a room privately with a person who was like, oh, my God, it's so terrible that he's, he's uh, besmirching the memory of a, uh, of a, uh, of a dead person, and, and I keep saying to myself, I don't know that anybody would say that privately, would they? I mean, literally, would anybody say privately that, that they personally are offended? Now, I think most people, when they're talking about how horrible it is that we're talking about um, a, a war hero in a negative way, I think most of those people are assuming that somebody else is offended. Could we make an agreement to simply be offended by things that offend us personally? You don't really need to be offended on behalf of other people who may, may, who may or may not exist. Um, Ed, Ed Latimer, if you are listening, uh, I think I've got a message from can't see the guest option. Hmm. Can one of you who is uh, watching this on Periscope, we're waiting for Ed to join, um, but maybe uh, can somebody explain in the comments where the prompt is? That Oh, actually, let me, let me call on somebody who's, who's on here. Ba -doop -ba -doop -ba -doop. Yeah, I'm going to call on a guest just to explain how to find and click on the guest button because I think it's not obvious. So watch how I solve this problem using all the technology. Guest, can you hear me? Good. Could, could you tell me how you found, because uh, I haven't used the guest option before, where is the, uh, the icon or the prompt to join as a guest? There's just a little button at the bottom near the left with two sort of smiley faces. So, Ed, look for the icon that has two little smiley faces, one superimposed on the other one. Click that, and that should get you in. Um, while you're here, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I did want to question you about the, the transgender thing and the women in sports. Oh, before... Um, before you do that, somebody just made an important point. And if you're watching this, you have to uh, you have to watch this on the Periscope app, not on Twitter. Twitter will show the video live, but you can't join 
directly through Twitter. So if you're if you're watching it on Twitter, there should be a Periscope um, icon. If you click that, it'll take you to the Periscope app, and then that will let you join. So I think I think that was was the problem. So yes, you were you were going to make a while Ed is uh, getting ready to join. Um, you, you what was your comment about the transgender? Well, issue? I feel that your position on transgender women and like sports is sort of inconsistent with your position on abortion. I'm not even sure they have anything in common. Well, you say you stay out of abortion because we should go with what the majority of women want. So if the majority of women say wanted to not have, you know, transgender women competing against them in sports, shouldn't we consider their opinion? Well, here's, uh, let me go back to uh, rule number one. Rule number one in the Scott Adams universe is that analogies are not the same as reason. So those are just two different things. So when you ask me that question, here's how it sounds in my head. Scott, you say that transgender people should be able to compete in women's sports, but how do you explain the fact that oranges have peels? And I just say, I don't. Those are just different situations. So I don't, I don't accept that there's any commonality in those two situations. Um, however, let me, let me not you know, try to use the trickery to get out of the question. The, the, uh, the issue is whether or not uh, the majority can block the minority. So we live in a world in which you wouldn't want somebody to have said in the past uh, we don't want to integrate the military because the majority of the military says they don't want to do it. So you, you would never take the majority opinion on a question of discrimination because you wouldn't even have a question of discrimination if the majority was already in favor of it. But is it discrimination? <laughs> right. It would, right if, no, no. If, is if the, is no, transgender I'm, I'm women discrimination? Because they're, cause they're, um, they're biologically men. So if women don't want to compete against biological men, which they don't right now, should they be forced to? Um, nobody is forced to uh, compete. Everybody can okay, say, I would, I would rather not be on this team. So I think what you would find is that it would be more like the Renee Richards situation, which is Renee Richards was transgender and played women's um, – played women's uh, tennis, uh, and it didn't destroy the sport. In fact, she didn't even become number one. She, she started when she was older. But the, the question is, um, if you were, let's say, an MMA fighter or a female boxer, that would be a situation where you definitely, you know, you would want to give all the competitors an option to not fight if they thought it would be dangerous. And I think that that would be something that they would, they would take that option. But um, if, if, the rules, if the rules of the sport are that women are in a certain league and the rules of society is that transgender is, um, is, is, let's say, taking you to your true gender or the gender that you prefer and the one that society has decided collectively that we're going to respect, as long as those two rules are in force that this is what it means to be to say that you're a woman in society and the rules are that women are in this league, you would have to change one of the rules to not let them compete. Now, if somebody wants to talk about a rule change for that purpose, that conversation is not happening. Um, and maybe it would. But my point of view is that these things always look like there's a reason to discriminate until we, we go ahead and make the change and then time goes by and you say to yourself, ah, I guess it didn't make any difference. Ima imagine going back in time to the conversation about women, the women having the right to vote. Can't you imagine being in a room, you know, back in whenever this was, early in the 1900s, can't you imagine that the men were saying, well, if the women vote, all hell is going to break loose. It's just going to be terrible. And then women voted. No, that sounds like an analogy it. to me that doesn't make sense. But, with what but and it, well, no, here, here, I'm giving you examples, not analogies. I'm telling you that throughout time, examples are always useful. Um, throughout time, whenever we thought the way you're thinking now, which is, wait, 
there's a really good reason that we, we should discriminate. We've always had a reason, but when we got past it, we found out our reasons were pretty much in our heads. And I would say that the Rene Richards situation um, would be one of those. Uh, try sending the guest again. All right, so the, the guest option is turned on by default. So every so right now I have five guests who oh, are... Scott, when I did it, I had to authorize it to enable my microphone. The oh, but time. I think there's a... Yes, uh, there's a different issue here. I think he's not seeing the option. Oh, okay. It is on. Has he updated? I don't know. It could be... Oh, maybe that's it. Because um, I just had to update this morning. Is app updated? Yeah, that option wasn't in the old version of the app, right? <clears throat> All right. Um, let me, the, the part that people always argue with me is the part that w we're not disagreeing about. So if I could change one thing about the world, it would be for people to stop arguing with me while agreeing with me. And... Oh, yes. Not, not browser. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing that people keep saying to me when I talk about the transgender issue and my position that they should be allowed to play in the women's leagues is that uh, people keep saying, Scott, don't you understand that, that they will have more muscles and have an advantage. And I say, yeah, we all understand that. We all understand that. That's, that's not part of my reasoning. All right, I think Ed is here. I believe I just saw him joining. And so, Nicholas, I'm going to drop you and go to Ed. All Thanks right. for calling. Ed will be with us in one moment. Ed, 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 are you there? Yes, I can hear you. Hey, hello. That took a little while, but I figured it out. Sorry, I was unclear in my directions. I, I, I think you may have been using the browser version that doesn't have that yeah, option. I started, that I started with the browser, and then I, then I realized, okay, I had to download this app. So I downloaded the app, and then once I went in with the app, and now everything is all good. We're right here. All right, great. Well, I'm glad to actually talk to you live. I've been following you on Twitter. Um, I, I will tell the the viewers here that uh, if you're not following Ed on Twitter, you're missing one of the best follows. So here behind me is Ed's um, Twitter handle. And what I what I love about Ed is that he has uh, one of the most interesting talent stacks, and we'll talk about this in a minute, which is a completely different sets of talents, which when they're put together are, are really strong. And I love his views on how to succeed, how to see the world more clearly, how to take more responsibility, and I'll let Ed do some talking about that too. But Ed, could you tell the audience um, some of your uh, biography highlights, you know, where, where were you raised and a couple of your career highlights so they, they can catch up. Uh, where was I raised? You know, it's, it's funny, the, the app on for, for Android, I think iPhone has it too, the TomHop app, get, you know, takes you back to posts you've made over the years. And I, I, I saw a post I made eight years ago where I was talking about where I lived and I grew up on a street called Mount Pleasant Road that's right in the heart <laughs> of like the worst housing project in Pittsburgh, PA, you know? So, so I grew up in, in the projects and is, I'm a product of that environment, the, the ghetto, all that, that type of stuff. Uh, I, I got out when I was 18 and, and tried college and, and wasn't prepared for it whatsoever at all. You know, I fell out in three semesters. It was three fun semesters, man. It's probably where I got my <laughs> first taste of uh, drinking, which is, which, which, got even worse into my 20s, and eventually I got, got sober and put the bottle down, and I really had to. I probably was going to do something unforgivable or, or irreversible. Uh, so I stopped drinking at 20, 28 or 27, 2013, however old I was then. Uh, and But during my 20s, I, I started boxing, and I was really that, that really helped the change and really gave me something – 
to to chase and because when you stop doing something it was so that's so integral to your personality you know like drinking was for me you have to replace that with something and fortunately i was very I, my life was set up for success and that i was i was really getting even more serious about boxing i was taking another step at school i had just joined the military so i could get money to go back to school and then serve and build points on my resume and i was just starting a serious relationship and i was like okay i think there's some uh some potential in this and you know it's, it's still here today so i guess my judgment was sound but yeah that's uh that's the abridged version there of like from so, so you didn't did you you were a teacher for a while, right? Did you teach physics? Oh, so so what I am is I'm a uh, a tutor with a with the school district around here, and that has defaulted me to the role of teacher for a lot of the kids. And now I have some homeschoolers as well, because oh, wow. as you do something well, I've I've learned yeah, people talk uh, when especially when it comes to their children, and so I, I've got a few kids, and and I really enjoy tutoring slash teaching depending on, on the situation and the student uh for physics math I'll, I'll do anything it well or rather i used to do anything when i had to do it for money now that i don't do it for money at all you know if it's not physics or math i'm not really interested so uh, all of my kids now are, are related and are, are pursuing those disciplines so your so your your talent stack has um you know, you went to college and you were a physics major, right? Right. Uh, you're uh, you were a professional boxer. Thirteen one and one was your record, right? Yeah, yeah. And and every now and then I I still think like, oh man, I might come back. And then I remember how much work and energy it take it takes <laughs> to compete. Right. Even at, even at a mediocre level, you know, I was putting in freaking twenty hours a week minimum. And, and as as fights come got closer. We're looking at 30 hours a week, and that's just training time. We're not talking studying and physical right. fitness and all that or lifting and running. And that's so, way too much at this point because my time is valued in other areas. So so now you have a book. It's called uh, Not Caring What Other People Think is a Superpower. It's on Amazon. You can get it. And I love the title, by the way. Oh, um, what, one of the things I love about your uh, your your tweets is that almost every time I read one, I end up almost hurting my neck by nodding in agreement too hard. Like, uh huh, uh huh. That's that's it. What you just said, and I'm I'm fascinated by where you came to your mindset because uh, you started with every disadvantage, right? You you were in a poor, terrible neighborhood. You were born black in America, and then you started drinking when you were a young man. Yeah, you pretty much. You pretty much were starting in a deep hole. Tell me what it was. Was there something about maybe your parents, one of your parents? Was, uh, did somebody give you give you a leg up in terms of your mindset? Where did that start? Well, well, the the real thing that that really helped me out. I was just writing about this. Is is boxing because really really prior to boxing, and I started boxing late. Uh, prior to boxing, I was afflicted with fixed mindset. I really thought that where I was was kind of what I would have to work with, and I could not improve anything. And one of the, the reasons I was writing about this is, is you know, in high school, I think I failed uh, or really close to it many of my math classes, if not all of them. And I, now I have a physics degree and a math minor, and I think my math GPA was like 3.9. And, and wow. the reason I was able to do that and even have the confidence to go back after these horrible, this horrible experience of math is I watched myself go from an uncoordinated, really untalented guy in boxing and just by, by little practice every day and, and working with it. But because I got into boxing because I wasn't doing anything in my life. So I go and do this and I'm like, all right, I'm either going to get beat out the gym or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm not going to quit this at all. And so I just watched myself get better and better and better. And I said, wow, okay, if I can improve my physical abilities this way, what can I do for my mind, right? Can, can I do the same thing for Matt? Right. And, and that's what, where, where I came from. Now, in terms of, you know, applying that to my emotional, my, or my, my emotional, you know, makeup 
or the way I see problems or my, my psychological disposition, uh, it, it, it's very similar. I, I really understand that nothing's going to kill me or okay there were things that are going to kill me i guess but the what most of the most of the things that people freak out about you know I, i've seen people get killed man like like come on like well how bad can can life be you know i've, I've had to i've been to, <laughs> to steal to, to eat and all that well let me <laughs> let, let me drill drill down on a few things all right so so there was the first message and it's very again it's so compatible with things i've said and and felt which is that i i often advise people to find something that they can do well. Because if once you experience going from being bad at something to being good at something, it, you often surprise yourself, which is exactly your story here. And I find that it, finding anything you can excel at just through practice, because the person who practices the most is going to get in the top 10%, you know, all other things being equal. So if you can practice your way into the top tier of any any skill, any knowledge, any anything, you suddenly think, well, I could probably do this again in a different area. Yeah. So did did you get uh, any of your philosophy from either parent? Uh, not, well, well, some of it. I mean, <laughs> like, like I, I wouldn't say, it's not accurate to just say I was raised in a single, or to, raise, to say I was raised by a single mother. But but to say my dad had like a, a, sh a formative hand in my upbringing, that's also not accurate. You know, he was around and he exposed me to some stuff. But for the most part, okay. I think I spent like ninety five percent of the time with my mom. Uh, my, my mom <laughs> really, my mom taught me not to be afraid of people. I really and, and afraid of things. You know, she she had a lot of flaws herself. But the one thing I really took uh, from my mom, my mom was the kind of parent. You know, if somebody was was messing with you outside. You know, we, we went several times and lined up kids that would be picking on us and we would, we would just fight. You know, we figured out. There, there was no, it, it was the kind of, you know, you either get your ass kicked by them or your ass kicked by me and then you're going to have to go back out and fight them anyway. So you might as well start. So, the, so that mentality of, of facing problems uh, is probably why I decided or how I approach boxing to begin with. And then that, that little nudge so, kind of thing. You know, so it, so it sounds like your mother told you to go at your problems instead of away from them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wasn't – and, you know, there's always the genetic part. You know, i got to remember that, that my sister, you know, she didn't turn out like me, and we got the same parents, <laughs> right? But, yeah. But what made me me is there are some things. You know, I'm, I'm also just I'm, – I'm, I'm stoic, I guess. I don't really get attached to to outcomes naturally. That's very – I, I trained it, but I came with it naturally. And then when you have that kind of perspective about, okay, it really doesn't matter what happens, combined with, all right, I got, I do have to face it because right now it's an inconvenience. Uh, you, <laughs> you don't have a problem. Let, Go let me stuff, man. Let, good time. Let, let me give you uh, some of the things that my mother taught me, and see if any of these ring ring true. I came, uh, I basically came out of the birth canal hearing the words, you're going to college. Like, you know, none of my parents didn't go to college. There's nobody in my family had gone to college at that point. But when we were born, my mother said, you're going to college, you're going to college. Like we, we didn't even know there was another choice. The other thing she told us is that you could be the best at anything you want to be. Totally untrue, but very motivational. <laughs> <'Cause>, because <laughs> she, she taught me a world where I had unlimited potential until I found out otherwise. She also told me to make decisions even if I wasn't sure, so to have a bias for action. So it was always act. You know, It's not about thinking, it's about acting. And then she also taught us to figure it out ourselves. So my college experience was figure it out. Figure out where you want to go and how you're going to go there, and I'll, I'll help, help you pay for it. So th those are the big lessons I got. Um, <laughs> you seem also big on the... Um, taking responsibility. That, that seems to be a theme that runs through a lot of your tweets. Uh, yeah. um, oh, for sure. And, and, and I also see the not caring what other people think is a superpower. If, if people only got one thing out of this, it would be a superpower. I, I tell people all the time that, um, that my superpower is the inability to be embarrassed. <laughs> for example... <laughs> Right. So, so, for example, we started this Periscope, 
And I, as your host, did a very poor job of, you know, making sure that you knew what to click and which app to use and stuff. So, we, you know, I had to tap dance. And in, in any normal situation, I should be embarrassed that I failed so hard in front of so many people, but I'm not because I'm doing a Periscope with you. We're providing value. I'm having a good time, and I've, I'll never remember that, that I had some trouble you know, uh, getting the, the tech to work. So tell me about not caring what other people think. How did you get to that point? Because most people can't get their ego out of the picture. How did, how did you get your ego free from other people's opinions? How did that happen? For me personally, I was suffering for it. You know, I really felt like I was wasting – some of my friends can't understand why I'm so hard on the way I lived my life prior to drinking. And it's because, you know, a lot of my drinking was centered around trying to be this guy that fit in. I wanted, I wanted to be liked. I didn't care about being respect so much as, as uh, respected as I did about people wanting to invite me to a party or invite me out. So that meant that I had to go, I had to go harder than everybody. I, I was like, I wasn't going to be the most respected, but I was going to be the, the most respected drinker, right? I was going to really put myself <laughs> in, in that realm, right? And right. and then I woke up, you know, you, it all starts with the bad hangovers and, you know, the, the text. You're like, oh, I can't believe I said that. Are you still going to be my friend kind of deal? And, and then and then it, it graduates and upgrades to doing stupid shit like, driving with some with some booze in your system to being flat out drunk and and i really i really sat and i looked at myself and i was like yo what what is all this for right like why do this you're smart enough to know so so what are you doing and and really i was i was trying to build an image an image i thought was what, what other people would care about or something <laughs> and and would make me be be liked and and eventually i said you know what uh I, I was 28. I said, you know, I'm going to turn 33 one day. I just happened to use that that number five years, and but but now I'm I'm 34, and I said I'm going to turn 33 one day. Am I going to be doing the same shit, or am I going to have more options in my life? You know, I, I I never imagined, for example, I'd be talking to you, but I guarantee if I was doing the same stuff, you'd have no interest. You probably never heard of me. People and probably put right. in jail would have heard of me, and then that's where I've been <laughs> been famous and popular. So, so that's where, where it came for me. I was paying a significant price, and, but it didn't seem that bad until one day, you know, I, when I when I when I enlisted, because I was still drinking when I enlisted, and and I showed up to a few drills, and, you know, still, you know, reeking of booze, man. It must have been awful, but but I went away for the basic training and AIT and all that, and I, I spent for the first time in my life, I think I, I spent. It was like 10 weeks, man. Uh, 10 weeks in basic training, no drinking. A lot of thinking, though, because you can't talk. And then 22 more weeks in AIT, no drinking, a lot of thinking. And I said, yo, I'm, I am fucked up. <laughs> like, that's pretty much uh, where it came from. And, and when I got back, man, I tried to go out and party again, and I made a fool of myself, and, and that was it. That was the last drink. I said, you know. There we go. And and that's related to not caring because th that's where I was paying for it right there. In fact, in the book, you know, I got the chapter on sobriety, which seems even though I wrote another book afterwards about being sober in my journey, I got a chapter in there about how you use your time and its relationship to sobriety because it was that it, it's that important to me. And that that's where my pain point was. Yeah, one of the things that uh, Naval Ravikant said on uh, my Periscope was, he said that in the old days, you know, if you went far back, uh, winning meant working hard. And then if you, you know, more modern times, it really meant about, you know, what you've learned. You know, it was about your education. That would be the key to success. But he says that in modern times, you know, now and forward, that the key to success might be your ability to handle your own addictions. Oh, and that that might that might be the single most um, you know most important variable because we can all we all have access to enough stuff that we could be successful if we were not addicted to something that would prevent us. So, um, so uh, my my great revelation in terms of uh, how other people thought about me 
was one one time I had a face laser laser treatment on my face to get rid of some spider veins, and for a few weeks my face looked like it threw, went through the windshield of my car. <laughs> so so it was all you know black and blue. It looked like I'd been you know, it looked like I'd been in a in a, in a boxing match with you, and I hadn't trained. And <laughs> for for the first two days, I said I can't go outside like this because everybody will look at me and stare. But after a few days, you get cabin fever, and you just say, oh, screw it. I'm going to go to the mall. And I remember walking through this crowded mall with hundreds of people walking past me, and me with a face that was sort of like, you know, the elephant man, you know, got in the fight sort of thing. And, and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way that people can do anything but stare and, and make fun of me, or, or at least stare. And then I noticed that absolutely nobody cared. Yeah. Nobody looked at me. <laughs> they all have their own problems. And so my my illusion was that other people care about other people. Like they care about their loved ones, but they don't really care about yeah, strangers. People, people really are busy, right? You said, you know, they got their own issues and their own problems. You know, I, I thought of it was something you said earlier about your your ability to not be embarrassed. I was I was thinking about this, and and I think I was in the fourth grade, and a teacher went out of her way to make me cry in front of the class. And I cried, man. I cried like a little bitch, man. And I and since that moment, I have never had a problem being embarrassed. That that like that was my reset point. So, wow. you know, not being embarrassed, that that was that was easy for me. You know, taking risks was easy for me. Being a fool was easy for me. Uh what was hard for me to deal with was feeling rejected and feeling like I was an outsider, like people didn't want me around. To this uh. day, to this day, I still have a fear of like throwing or organizing any type of party because I don't think anyone's going to show up because why would they want to come hang out with me? And and that, <laughs> that's even weird to hear come out of my mouth because uh, even here right now, I'm looking down. It's like, I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of them are here for you, but then, you know, there are people and people follow me on Twitter. And I think like, why would people want to spend their time, you know, hanging out with me? So so we all have the hangups about, about this stuff. It's just... How do you manage it? And my way of managing it was very destructive. And then I went and found a better way. I said, okay, if I can't be like, let me let me be the coolest, most respected, accomplished dude ever. And and that's working out for me. That's a much better way because I still have the insecurity. But now, now, I, now wouldn't you say I've I've had this observation before that successful people are usually successful because of a flaw. Not not despite a flaw. I mean, they have to overcome whatever obstacles as well. But I would say in my own case that I'm never satisfied with my own success, meaning the moment I do something I had planned to do, I say, well, that's great, but it really wasn't that much. <laughs> and and then I'm, you know, so so I have this impossible to satisfy myself type of personality, which um, you have some version of that. So wouldn't you say that there's a, a flaw that drives successful people? Oh, I, absolutely. Because here's the thing. If you, if you like everything about yourself, what the hell are you going to try and improve? You know? <laughs> right. And, and that's what all success comes down to is, you know, I was trying to make something cool happen for me or the world, and uh, here it is. And and even the people who are out there, you know, like like the Elon Musk of the world, who are trying to trying to genuinely create something that is going to affect and benefit humanity. You know, he's he's got to be that guy's too driven to not have some issues, man. Like, like we right. all have something that is like, well, yo, you know, if if you don't do this, man, you know, you know, you're going to be a piece of shit, right? That kind of thing. <laughs> and it's like sitting there in the back of my mind, so. You, you go do these things, you know. It's like working on the gym, you know. People people complain like, man, running is hard. And I'm like, yeah, but being fat is harder. Like, that's, that's the response. <laughs> hey, I, can, I can deal with, with, you know, killing myself on the treadmill. What I can't deal with is, like, feeling like people are pointing at me going, yo, that dude has got a gut. Like, you know, and, and everyone's got their own <laughs> insecurity, but however they use it to push them, well, here's what I think. I think you can use it uh, to push you positively or constructively, or you can use it to, to in the most destructive ways to make yourself feel better. Some people become uh, leaders. Uh, some people become leaders, you know? 
All right. So um, having learned what you've learned, uh, you're, you're at sort of the perfect spot of your life and you have the perfect life arc to give useful insights and advice to somebody who is, let's say, you and you at age 14. So if you were going to talk to, let's say, a, a kid with, who didn't come from a good situation and is still in a, good situ- in a bad situation, and you were going to give them the most important uh, advice, something that would change the way they frame their experience, something that would be you know, doable, something you could actually act on that would improve your life, what would that look like? What are, what are some of the things you would say to somebody 14 year old who's got the same challenges or something or similar to what you had, they're trying to make it out. I, I would tell them to figure out where, where, where they're like their natural motivation is and then try to become like an ass kicker, like a top 10%. There. Like when I was younger, I always, lo- I loved communication and telling stories and teaching. I, that, that was just natural to me, you know? And so I'm, I think one of the worst things I did was try to get away from that for a long time. And now it's it naturally where I where I find peace at. You know, I'm at, at my peace talking to a bunch of people, teaching people, being in front, public speaking, there's no nervousness there. That that's my, my natural advantage. If I had focused on that, you know, something something that would have taken advantage of that ability, I would have I would have ignored a lot of and, and I guess I did to some extent. You know, I, I was fortunate enough to to when I was fourteen <clears throat> go to another high school across town in a very different area and get exposed to a lot of different stuff. And one of the things that, that kept me out of it is, you know, I didn't nec- I didn't like sports that much, but I said, let me play football because I'm going to stay away from all that. So, so that was just like a, a secondary way to, to go about it. You know, I, did, I didn't go where I was strongest, which was this kind of communication leadership role. I, I went and played sports and, and, and tried to play sports anyhow. <laughs> it's, it's probably a better way to put it. Uh, the other thing I would tell them besides find some place uh, where you're where you're naturally interested in trying to motivate and get strong is man you get in the gym. I above all things, I think when you when you watch your body improve, you you see that's a thing you can control and there you go. put some time into yeah. and it pays you back quickly. People notice your whole life, you know. Can, can go from zero to hero just by spending six months, you know, taking care of your nutrition. And that's, the- yeah, that, that's exactly what I wanted to hear you say. Because fitness and, um, and nutrition are unique in that it's something that 100% of people can succeed at. You know, there aren't, there aren't many things where you could put a lot of work in and you'd just, just be guaranteed to, be, to have a payoff. Yeah. And that's one of them. And the thing that people don't understand is how much, fitness influences the way they think the the kind of challenges they're willing to take the amount of embarrassment they're willing to take you know every every bad feeling that you have that that limits you is decreased after a good workout <laughs> you know you actually just feel like a different person and, after you work and out. most importantly here's something that i that i did not lean on that hard at the beginning of my boxing career, but but absolutely saved me in the end. Uh, when you're in the gym and you're trying to maintain yourself, you you kind of stop doing a lot of shit that's going to take away from the gains you have made, like staying out all night drinking. You know that is one of the the, the things that the fighting really did for me at the beginning. At the beginning, when I was an amateur, I, I, I adhere to like, you know, you don't drink the week of the fight, right? And that was hard. That, that shouldn't have been hard not drinking a week. But as I became a pro and I, and I got really serious, that was one of the, the, the big factors. I said, yo, you're trying to do this thing seriously now. Uh, you probably should just cut out the drinking entirely, you know? So, uh, right. So doing, working on your body just, just puts you in a place where you don't even have time to, to do a lot of other bullshit that would, that would work you so, so the other things that I see you doing productively is that you are a, a seeker of knowledge, which is, uh, and tell me if I've got this wrong, but it seems far more than the average person, you are actually testing your environment all the time to pick up a new skill, a new way of looking things, read a book, you know, have an experience. 
Uh, am I reading that right? Are you, no, are you absolutely. a seeker? In fact, that's one of my problems right now, and it's a good problem, uh, is I said when I finished school, I was going to, you know, be done with school and and get get to focusing on other things in my life that need to be taken care of. And and I really should keep focus on the, focusing on those, but I really want to go and and start working towards because I asked myself, I don't I don't remember where I read this. But the but the author said that instead of asking kids what they want to be when they grow up, we should ask them what problems they want to focus on, what problems they want to solve. And so that that always stuck with me. And I just kept thinking about the, the problems I'm interested in and, and why I was drawn to physics as opposed to other disciplines. And so so now I'm like, all right, when can I start my my uh, post <laughs> my, my, my uh, graduate studies, I guess. And, and I know that I, I shouldn't do that. But I'm drawn to it. So instead, what do I do? I, I, I read books and and I try to. Do, I still do problems on my own to make sure my mind stays sharp. And and I'm always listening. I just discovered the um, PBS has this great series on YouTube uh, where they where they just break down different physics problems and stuff. That that's been like the best discovery ever. Is that I can just plug my phone into the auxiliary cord. I don't have the. Um, I got the old Cadillac at the year, the 2010 people who know me and follow me know I, I take pictures of my Cadillac. I'm a big, big fan of this car, uh, but I, it doesn't have a Bluetooth in it. So I plug in the auxiliary cord and I'm always listening to, to the podcast about the, you know, the math, ma mathematics and physics. And I'm, I'm, always, I'm, I'm moving to Portugal in the, in the summer. And so now I'm picking up Portuguese and that's great because I spent a lot of time working on my Spanish. Uh, there's just so much to learn. I'm not going to live long enough to learn even a tenth of what's important. So, yeah. But I try, you know, and, and I really feel like part of that is my natural curiosity. But another part of that is I really feel I feel deprived of, of a childhood where I was had the ability to be exposed to things. I think a lot of kids, you know, people forget or maybe they don't forget because they <laughs> I tell them sometimes I didn't I didn't play any like pop Warner sports. There was none of that because. Because my mom had this weird issue where she wouldn't, she didn't want us to want me to be known as just another black athlete kid, right? So I didn't play any sports, but I also didn't get exposed to like any type of like I wanted to play chess or learn piano or something, things like that. None of that, right? So, so now I, I guess I try to make up for it as an adult where I can do those things and I can take care of it myself. Wow! So I'm watching some of the comments go by people. Uh... Somebody said they bought 12 copies of your book, and it was amazing. Oh, and wow. somebody else said you should turn it into an audio book. Oh, yeah. Um, I've been meaning to do that. Yeah, because uh, hearing it in your own voice would be more impactful, I think. Now, the, the, the things that you can't, you can't really change are you're, you were born curious, and uh, as was I, which makes it easy to learn new skills because you were naturally curious. I worry about people who are not naturally curious. It seems to me that might be the biggest, maybe the biggest obstacle anybody could ever have is, is to not be curious. I wonder how, how, how uh, predictive that would be of people's success. Uh, intellectual curiosity is the most important thing to me when, when evaluating, you know, that, that when I was looking at my girl, uh, when I first met her, I was like, "Oh, what an intellect! What a curious person!" You know, I, I don't, I'm not really interested in like what you have learned or or what you have accomplished. I want to know what you are interested in doing and what what steps you're taking in that direction. Well, you know, because we all have different obstacles and our different points in our journey. But you know, what are you doing to advance on yours? You know, so that right. is. That's what's important to me. And intellectual curiosity ensures that you're always going to be discovering different ways to improve your life, I think. Uh, when, when I look at people who are, who are stuck, uh, a lot of them are stuck because, because of, aside from not acting on the advice they get, they don't find any new advice. So they don't, yeah. they don't find, they, they don't see people who are living a certain way. They're just not exposed to anything beyond what they know. So how could they know anything Beyond, let's go home and watch the next one. So when I hear you talk and I look at your, your tweets and your advice and stuff, I, I always see a theme, which I like to put in my own words, which is systems are better than goals. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure you've had both, 
But when you talk about, you know, continuously sampling new things, that's a system that doesn't have a specific outcome, but you know it's going to be better than if you didn't do it. Right. So that's, that's a good system is that you're going to come out ahead. You just don't know how. Um, so I, I see that in everything you do. I see a systems kind of a thinking, you know, how do I, how do I train? <laughs> You know, it's not it's not about starting with a win. It's how do I train now? Uh, and so what else is there anything else that's in your top three things you would tell the 14 year old you? Um, ooh. Those, those are always what? the tough questions. Those are those are like two generals. And I, I'll give them one specific one. You know, to, to quote that old song, man, never trust the big button to smile. You, you don't don't do that. Uh, if if you, if you can if you can avoid if you can avoid dating the wrong people and picking up alcohol, uh, then that can be easily. <laughs> but but really avoid the wrong people, man. That, that is a. Ugh. Well, well let, let me. I'm looking. I can look at some of your tweets, and I want to just unpack one. So you had a recent one just 11 hours ago, uh, and you you tweeted uh, people really have uh, the ass backwards nerve to think that their problem with you is your concern. <laughs> so that, that gets back, it gets back to your not being bothered by other people's opinions. I, I love that one. I think you've talked about that one enough, <clears throat> but um, I'm just going to pick another one. Uh, oh, here's a, here's a, here's one I love. Your personal future should make you excited. If it doesn't, then something is very wrong. I, I always give the advice that you should have at least one project going on in your life. It could be your side project, but one thing that could really change the world or change you, you know, either one, whichever excites you, because I wake up sometimes into a boring life too. You know, I just got to get some stuff done. I got some deadlines, but I've always got, it might only be 10 minutes that day that I did a little research. I purchased an item I need to get something done. I talked to somebody, I made a phone call, but I always have, one little project that could change the whole world if it worked. Yeah. And, you know, usually it doesn't. So it sounds like <laughs> you're always looking for that thing to, to pull you. Well, I, <laughs> I try to, because look, if, if you don't have something that, to get you out of bed, man, <clears throat> I, I feel, I can't, I can't imagine that, you know? And, and I've, I've had those, I, once again, you know, I always talk about my life pre-drink, post drink right the the best part about post drink is like every day man i feel like i gotta make up for for you know pre-drink and yeah. <laughs> so, so 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 every day I'm, I'm, I'm working on on something to put out there into the world or some way to improve myself that's going to help me put something out better you know to the world now let, let me ask you a, a very if you can give I'm going to ask you an impossible question. So be, before you answer, just know that <laughs> if, if you could answer this question, it would be the greatest answer of, of any question because it would unlock such potential. And so let me ask the question and see if I've got my assumption right first. Um, I'm looking at one of your tweets where you say, success shows you who, who's really rooting for you and who is hoping you'd fail. Not all of your, quote, friends are going to be happy you make it and it will show. Now, I've made the comment that there, there's something called that I call cultural gravity, meaning your friends are either helping you or they're dragging you down. And um, I feel like I had low cultural gravity because even though I was born into poor circumstances, I was surrounded by people who were literally rooting for me to succeed, and I could feel it all the time. Now, in your where where you grow up, did you think that people were rooting for your success or maybe working against it? Oh, well, okay. Uh, let me let me preface everything I'm about to say with the following statement. I experienced little to no active interference in my progress, right? Now, in terms of passive, you know, people not really, you know, the environment I was around, the attitudes that I, that I was around, oh, man, the, the hardest part, I think, about getting out of, of a circumstance like that is, as a child, is not just falling into it. it it's around you every day, and you're reminded every day 
that this is the future for ninety nine percent of people like you. And well, well, let me, but let me, let me ask the specific question. I'm, uh, I assume, based on the fact you have a degree in physics, that you were a good student in school. Do, were you ever? Did you ever get mocked for that? Oh, oh, absolutely. When I was a child, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 how and and how did you overcome that? Because so here's the here's the uh, the question that could unlock the universe. I'm hoping the answer is not. It's just something about you that no, no. you were unbothered by. It. Is there is there a technique? Is there a mindset? Is there anything that can free you from other people trying to drag you down by mocking? the thing you're doing for success? Well, I, you know, I used humor a lot. I tried to be, I tried to laugh at them, laugh at myself. And, and, and still though, understand deep down inside that this was better. So you, so you need, you, you need a dream, I guess for, for, yeah, you need a dream to use a cliche term, something you're going after. Otherwise, you know, that, that social pressure can, can wear you down. I think one of the best things that happened to me when I was a child, they kept me from succumbing to and trying to become friends and really try to make it in with a lot of people around me is is I, I wanted just different stuff. I, I couldn't play sports. I wasn't trying to be a sports guy. I, you know, I was terrified to get my ass kicked at home. So... I was I, I tried to stay away from doing anything that was remotely like bad or question. But I was a kid, I didn't even swear, you know, and because I was afraid they were gonna call my mom, and my mom she ain't care, right? I, it was just an ass kicking. <laughs> so those things, you know, I had some deterrence, but what I wanted was just a different life. I wanted something more, man. I I retreated to my video uh, game. Do you think? I, so <laughs> you you don't. You know the concept of a uh, emotional, uh, uh, no emotional intelligence, meaning the ability to uh, give up on your current pleasure because you got something bigger you're working for. Yeah. And I hear that I hear in you an emotional, uh, let's say emotional intelligence that is unusual. Meaning, meaning that when you started boxing, for example, you knew it was going to be a lot of bad hard work <laughs> yeah. to 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 maybe get to something good. You joined the military, which is a lot of risk and work and sacrifice, but for something better, so you could get your school paid for. Do, do you think, and when I hear you say you, you had something better in mind for your life, so you could take the mocking about you know, being good in school, that rings true with me. Because every now and then, I was, I was valedictorian of my tiny little class, and so, so all throughout school, there there would be you know people would call me a nerd and you know whatever negative word they could come up to come up with for being a good student, and I always thought to myself, someday you're going to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was never one time in my life I didn't have that that recording going in my head, and it, it always sounded the same in my head. Yeah, you're laughing now. Check back with me in 20. I didn't think that way, <laughs> but I always did say, you know, I probably am not going to end up in prison or with kids when I'm 18. You know, I used to think that. That that was my, you're going to work for me. It was, I'm not going to be, you know, in prison with you. That kind of deal. But, but, but I'm really, I mean, in terms, you, you want to talk about, about, about luck. And there, there are some things that I'm really grateful for. And one of the things I'm grateful for is that when I was, when I was 14 going into high school, in, in Pittsburgh, we have, I don't know if we still have it, we had it, a magnet system, as long as you got a, a lottery magnet system. So there was a school across town, it was a completely different environment, and and my mom got up and we got the first lottery pick uh, for that, and I, I got to go to a school. Now, granted, now, now I had a new challenge, which was uh, part of that school did feed into a, a different hood, but... I wasn't around those kids, and it was an hour and a half bus ride uh, every day there. Back oh, oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I, I feel like we, I feel like we just hit like the key to everything, and I may, I may be missing this, but you had a mom who was willing to completely upend your situation and make you go an hour and a half to school to get a better situation. This, this is very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a systems, long-term planning. I mean, your mom sounds like she was modeling 
what you have taken as, as a life philosophy, which is this is going to be seriously hard right now. Well, let's, let's, let's uh, you know, give credit where credit is due <laughs> to do sometimes. You know, I, I, I said earlier in passing, my sister is not like me. I mean, she's, she's doing all right, better, certainly. But, but one of the big differences is that I had this unpleasant experience in the middle school and elementary school and in my neighborhood, and I didn't want any more of that, and I knew that if I stayed there, I wasn't going to get more. So, so I, I pestered, and I said, that's where I want to go. Or at the very least, I said, I don't want to go around here. So we're going to go and put the lottery in. You have to, like, go down to the uh, Board of Education here <laughs> and, and, you know, put your name in and all that. So, so, oh, so wait, <laughs> you're saying I had, a completely, I had it completely backwards. It was you talking to your mother. Yeah. Now, my sister didn't want to go. <laughs> she, my sister went to the local school. So she ended up, you know, she still got all her friends are from there. And, and really – uh Going to that school is is one of the things that I credit with me not turning into a total scumbag. Because what do you what what do you think about the idea of uh, charter schools? Then are you up on that? I'm not a big expert on that, um, but uh, it, it's I hear such good things about that. It's as far as I understand it, and I'm sure I'm going to get not get this completely right, and someone in the comments is going to kill me, but. As far as I understand it, it, it's still just another curriculum um, that is mandated by someone else. And my big thing, while I'm a big fan of homeschooling, is that it you, you're not moved on the pace of your peers. You're moved mm -hmm. on the pace that you're on and what your parents feel is important. I mean, these are the people who decided, hopefully decided anyhow, that your life was important enough to produce so they should get some say or and certainly more say than I think uh, most people have in how it's directed and what you're exposed to and how you're advocated. You, you, and I don't think that. I have to say, I started out the first time I ever heard about homeschooling, you know, when, when it first started being in the news. My first impression was feeling sorry for those kids because they, you know, didn't get a regular school experience. But I realized later in life, and I heard more about it, and I saw more kids who went through homeschooling. Mm. I don't think I've ever seen a homeschooled kid who was messed up. Right. Because people but, have the wrong idea. It's not like it's not like, you know, you're sitting in a room and your parents are your teachers and that's all, you know, you're only now granted they are like they should be instructing you. But, uh, but it's not like that's your only exposure. Like like my girlfriend was homeschooled in a homeschool co op. It was a neighborhood of people and then and to be part of that co op, uh, one of the parents brought a skill set that they would teach to you know the kids and then they, they switched off and, and then they wow. were just raised in a different environment there wasn't you know pe people always talk about you know they need socialization i'm like have you seen the people that come out of regular school like it's not like it's not like that's doing a great job you know? <laughs> yeah yeah if if i look at my school experience if i'd never heard of homeschool and somebody said well how was your school experience i'd say you know normal good no problem <laughs> it went about the way you'd expect but then you actually, if you actually think about it, because you just get used to your own experience, like you're, you just think whatever you're doing is the normal thing. But much of it was horrific. Much of it was just horrific. Yeah, and I wouldn't is. have had that if I had been homeschooled. A lot, of, you know, a lot of stuff, as they say, you know, you can't unsee or unremember, man. School is not, and we're not talking about the normal taunting, man. I mean, we used to just, just between the fighting and, and the fighting is a big thing because that's one of the things that set me back is when I was coming out of uh, middle school where I was supposed to be learning, we were too busy dealing with disciplinary issues. So I never, I'm like, oh man, this algebra thing is busting my ass. Well, it turns out no one ever, I never learned algebra. I was too busy <laughs> dealing with kids getting kicked out of fights having me broke up. Right. All right. So uh, we're, we're coming to the end of the uh, our hour here. And this was great. And I want to remind everybody, uh, if you're not already following Ed Latimer on Twitter, you're missing one of I, I put you in my top five. Whenever anybody asks me who they should follow on Twitter, I, I usually have a, you know several names, but you're always in my top five um, and always enjoy seeing your tweets. I love your story. I love what you're putting back into the universe, Ed. I love I, I love the the positivity and and what I'd call the the useful 
thoughts that you're that you're projecting into the universe. They're, they're amazingly useful. So I appreciate you very much. I hope everybody goes and buys your book and follows you. Uh, and say the name of your book again. I'm not caring what other people think is a superpower. Insight from a heavyweight boxer. And also, if you're struggling with any type of addiction, my, my other book, uh, Sober Letters to My Drunken Self, is about the emotional transition that I, that I made from you know, being an alcoholic to being sober now for five years. And I, th I hope a lot of people get a lot out of that. I, I wrote that book, you know, because it's a piece of my heart, man. I wanted, I wanted to give something back that was really for that's, help people. That's very valuable. And I would say um, my startup makes an app called the Interface, Interface by Wenhub in which experts, which could include addiction counselors or just people who are experts in – in any field, can take calls for people and people can charge for those calls, anything they want. So, Ed, if you ever wanted to use that someday, you probably would have a built-in audience and I could help you promote that. And uh, But I'll just throw that out there. You don't need to answer about that. Um, and um, say goodbye, everybody. Bye, Ed. See ya. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ed. All right. That was our show for today, and I will talk to the rest of you tomorrow.